Стелт. A genre representing rather niche playstyle yet finding success and popularity amongst gamers throughout the years. That was once upon a time. Today stealth has been relegated to the no so called either stealth sections and levels or just stealth mechanics that come into play if the player so desires. But this wasn't the case some years ago when stealth thrived with amazing, innovative and interesting games filled with variety on how to approach different scenarios and because they were brilliant, I loved them. I'll never forget the great memories I managed to experience with some of the foremost stealth games ever made. Made. Today, most AAA games are only implementing partial and quite lazy stealth mechanics. But I'm happy that newer titles are coming from time to time to prove that their developers interested in making full-fledged stealth experiences. But this isn't about the genre itself. This is about the game that made me love and appreciate the world of espionage, all these special operatives. <laughs> No, not that one, whose work is to embrace the shadows avoiding not just your typical guards but also modern surveillance. There's one franchise that manages to do this almost flawlessly and that is Splinter Cell. Developer once a favorite studio of mine, Ubisoft Montreal, the game's development initially started as a sci-fi title, but it was quickly scrapped as it was described as having no soul, the definition that describes most of today's Ubisoft games. Tasked with creating a stealth game, they were inspired by an already established hit, Metal Gear Solid. Being endorsed by an already big author such as Tom Clancy, who also helped with writing scenarios, they were on a way to create something very special. Taking also notes from legends in the genre such as Steve and Deus Ex, they managed throughout the years to deliver one of the quintessential of stealth games, a height that hasn't been reached by many others. But before we reach the zenith, we have to talk about the beginning of this meticulous franchise. So let us step into the shadows and be invisible. This is Tom Quancy's Splinter Cell. When it comes to look, Splinter Cell being 19 years old, aged beautifully. A small part of me speaks based on the fondness I have for Unreal Engine 2.0 because so many games I grew up with were made with it. But I think it stands out compared to some of the others that come around the same year. Now I might speak with a little bit of bias, but it doesn't look bad, especially if you apply the PlayStation 3 texture pack from the HD trilogy, which alas wasn't available for PC. Back in the day I didn't fully appreciate the tremendous achievement the Dynamic Shadows accomplished and how important this was for the type of game it is. But since it was built for older hardware, you might have a bit of a problem making them work on the newer machines. This is where we must apply the widescreen and shadow fix combined into one zip file to make things more visually pleasing for us. Unless you're one of those old school players who have a dedicated old PC hooked up to a CRT monitor, for which I salute you. The game features a more realistic look, but thankfully since it was made before the standard of making games greyish, it isn't devoid of color, especially in the night levels which this game is mostly comprised of. Considering we're trying to be sneaky, the environment still manages to be highlighted because of the dynamic light some sources such as lamps, bulbs and so on emit. Light can be certainly a disadvantage to you, which makes the ability to destroy majority of the sources quite important. Shadows vary from sharp to soft, giving a degree of detail when light passes through or between different objects. Some areas have been embedded into my memory since the very first time I played this game and I think it's because of the wonderful way the lighting manages to strike the environment. Certainly, it's noticeable the prevailing age of the engine, from textures to the distant landscapes in some areas, but that isn't something I would regard as a major issue. The art style is more realistic and grounded than most games that tackle such subjects, which makes it a tad bit more believable. To me that is far more important than anything else, but what makes the games unforgettable are the unique scenarios and challenges we're presented. After all, graphics are like a topping of a delicious ice cream, a slight bonus to an already lovely taste. Do you remember when sound mattered in stealth games? Who in the hell are you supposed to be? When the slightest loud move you made would mean reloading to an earlier save. Who's there? I know, it's a memory of distant past when you could use all your senses to detect an enemy and the enemy could detect you. Having said that, the sound here is fantastic. Effects from explosions, fire, 
to the little glass breaking and other details are captured brilliantly. Weapons are distinct, albeit mostly suppressed for noise reduction purposes, but gadgets... Oh, the gadgets! My brain never forgot the silly little sound they made when they deployed. Identify yourself! Especially the legendary goggles. What else is remarkable is the stellar voice acting done by Don Jordan as Lambert and the one and only Michael Ironside as Sam Fisher. Together they fit perfectly like a glove and bring such a class to the game. And we didn't know about it. Nobody did. What does he want? You can watch the news later. Rendezvous with Junior Wilts for extraction. Fisher, you're gonna like this. It makes me nervous when you say that. The dialogue between the little guys also has to be mentioned. They bring so much life with descriptive moments and it's something I appreciate quite a lot. The real estate is closer to your rent in the morgue. Slabs are going for cheap. Yeah, I think we could set you up with this slab real easy. I've done nothing. Please. Nothing? How about drunk and disorderly? Assaulting a police officer? Slandering the badge? You said we associated with criminals. Ah, then arrest me. I must sleep. Weren't you listening? The rent's gone up in jail. You want to die tonight? That's free. You want to sleep tonight? It'll cost you 100 lari. Oh, please. I don't... I don't... Oh... <clears throat> Ah, uh, now what are we going to do with him? Check his pockets. I'll radio HQ. Sure. Unit 3 to dispatch. We have a 1053. Possible assault. Can you send an ambulance? Copy that, Unit 3, but we're dealing with a warehouse fire, so expect delay. Roger that, dispatch. We'll wait with the victim. Unit 3 out. Assault? Something we can pin on Costa. <laughs> Good thinking. For a serious game like Splinter Cell, you can notice the developers had fun making the world and the random characters you pass by a little bit a bit at times. I'd like to talk to your superior. Perhaps I can help you, sir. By fetching your superior. I'm all there is. How can I help you? I'd like to register a complaint. Then you'll have to ask at the desk to your right. Very well. May I help you? You're the same cop. Yes, but this is the public relations desk. Fine. I would like to register a complaint. Of course, sir. If you could just have a seat until somebody's ready to help you. You've got to be kidding me. I could easily have you arrested, sir. The only issue I have is that nobody is speaking their native language. I was never a fan of visiting countries where every resident speaks near-perfect English with their own accent. Put Gringo on. Because those are my orders. I speak to Vyacheslav Grinko or nobody. As The soundtrack for such a title isn't easy to make, but Michael Plowman, whose name I wish I could say more times, delivers with its electronic beats that underlines the tensity of some situations quite well. and the action when present. Splitter Cell isn't about action as advertised on the box. It shines as a methodical stealth game for those like me who prefer to take things slowly and perform them silently. Played in the third person perspective, it features mechanics lost throughout time that made these old games so special. Something a lot of games don't rely anymore in terms of gameplay is a very important key element, sound. For example, the ability to increase or decrease your moving speed in order to approach an enemy silently, because otherwise they'll hear you. I think I heard somebody. Can I help you? 
an integral part when it comes to sneaking around as it just makes things extra sweet when you pass a mission and nobody knew you were there. You can use sound to your advantage and hear when an enemy is approaching by simply listening and you can react in time if they are nearby. But when it comes to movement, here at first appears to be as smooth as butter until you reach certain points that require a bit of finesse, like jumping and voting. It works fine most of the time, but there are moments when it shows how clunky some actions can be. Mostly when it comes to jumping and grabbing certain objects, like pipes, you can see the awkwardness of the actions and it quickly reminds you of the game's age. As a stealth game, you have two important factors to consider if you want to make sure you're not detected by the enemy. We talked about sound, but there's also visibility on that front. As always, shadows are your best friend to hide when needed to be one with the darkness. What the hell? To understand how visible you are, the developers have included the nifty visibility gem from Thief in the form of a meter. Not only one of the most valuable and fundamental parts of any stealth game, but also the most neglected and sadly forgotten because nowadays every stealth revolves around hiding in either a bush or tall grass. Here you must constantly be on your toes and rely on trial and error by utilizing patience above all else. There isn't a level in here that doesn't provide you with the means of hiding if shadows are out of the question. There is always the environment. See? It's still spraying! I swear I turned it off! Sure you did! I did! To help you navigate around, we have our unique tri goggles, but currently this game has only two options, the night vision and the thermal vision. The night vision is self-explanatory. The thermal vision is used in very specific situations, for example you want to see if someone is coming your way, as it lets you see tanks emitting heat through thinner objects. One of my favorite missions that takes place in a meat processing facility, for example, is when you'll be thankful for it. Because of the condensation in the air and the surrounding fog, enemies are tough to see through. Of course, this isn't your only tool for keeping an eye for potential threats. As I mentioned earlier, the game also has a cover mechanic, which by today's standards isn't something new. You can stand behind something by pressing the corresponding button to stick to it, and you can also use the directional buttons while stuck to peek from it. This is very useful, not just for peeking to observe oblivious enemies, but also to shoot. Come out! As I said, a standard now, considering every third person game utilizes this, but not in the early 2000s. The same doesn't go for the following and that's door peeking. It was a novelty back then and never caught up. The ability to open a door slightly, slowly and check around is such an important addition even if you have a gadget that does a better job.
I just wish details like this didn't go away with the strong push for graphical fidelity, because it's the things I remember a game for. The core gameplay of Splinter Cell may be simple, but in its simplicity lies the satisfaction. Most missions revolve around sneaking around to complete your objective by being constantly aware of your surroundings, spending time in learning the layouts of the levels so you can finish the mission as you see fit. You need to learn God's patterns by being patient and keeping an eye on any surprises. I just spotted somebody in the auditorium. Maybe our intruder. I need backup now. The best way to gather information about the surroundings of a room comes in the form of an optic cable. By placing it under a door, it gives you the needed information and you can plan how to proceed forward. But certain doors are locked, either by the lock or other security measures. For the former, you'll be needing the invaluable lock pick, and each time you have to feel your way by guessing and pressing the corresponding directional buttons. This mini game isn't anything special, but the ability to see around, hoping you're not going to get caught, is what makes things more thrilling. Of course, there will be times when you'd want to pick something as fast as possible so you don't get caught. Happily, there is the disposable pick for such cases, which near instantly melts and leaves nothing that's going to obstruct you from getting through. For the max security doors, however, certain methods need to be taken. Some have a retinal scan and the capturing of a high ranking officer is required to pass forward. Others have a keypad and the need to search for the right code is necessary. This code sometimes is in the possession of a single guard who needs to be interrogated or in one of the computers that are scattered around in each level. But there is one special method on how to unlock such locked doors and it is my favorite. Using the thermal vision on a keypad after someone has already inputted the code. You see, they don't just leave fingerprints, but also a little bit of heat on those magical numbers. Beautiful. To help you navigate throughout the level, your best friend will be the SC-20K and its underbarrel launcher that can deploy several very useful little gadgets. The earliest one is a sticky camera and yes, it is a tiny camera that sticks to any surface in order to take a better view of your surroundings. It can be heard by anyone if deployed too close to them, so make sure to have a plan as it can be used for distraction. A bit later into the game, you get the upgraded distraction camera that serves the same purpose as the sticky cam but has two wonderful additions to it, one being creating cricket noises to attract those who are in your way and secondly to release a bit of gas so you can either take them out safely or just pass them while they're struggling breathing. Who's there? The third little guy is the Sticky Shocker, a wireless taser device that will incapacitate anyone hit with it, leaving them unconscious unless awoken. This can be good for these poor souls. Fourth and my favorite, the silent airfoil ring which either stuns your target briefly or if you manage to hit them on the head, they collapse senseless with unknown mental injuries. Fifth and final part of your rifle toolkit is the gas grenade, dispersing a cloud which will come in handy if there are multiple guys who wish to make their day miserable. <laughs> 
Except guards, you have the pleasure to sneak around cameras as well. Some can be shot to be disabled and weirdly nobody comes around to check what happened to them. But others, such as the bulletproof ones, you need the camera jammer. Just point, shoot and hold while slowly advancing to a position where it can detect you. It has a limited range but it's enough for any occasion. Finally we have the laser microphone to spy on important targets in specific missions. It doesn't get much use but it's still cool to have it implemented in the game. Beside these harmless tools there's more on your hefty US Army knife. Like the chemical and regular flares. You might wonder why they are here considering we're trying to sneak in and utilize the darkness to our advantage. But we will employ them in a few levels that have the automatic turret. Drowned by heat, throwing one of the light makers lets you pass without them turning you into a Swiss cheese. Along the way, you might stumble on objects such as cans and bottles, your standard noise makers for leading guards away from their current positions, but also the glass bottles can be used for non lethal takedowns. I've got a man unconscious. Beautiful. Life-wise, you have a health bar that you might forget about while sneaking around, but for moments like these, you need to gather the medkits placed around to heal up if you suffer from any damage. That's the good stuff. And thus, this is pretty much everything that will help you tackle the mission's tasks, varying from gathering vital information, locating important targets or items, to straight out assassination. Speaking of killing, the arsenal for dispatching enemies fatally isn't that big. You have your reshot rifle, pistol, the occasional grenade and you will barely have any time to place a wall mine that will obliterate anyone passing by. Mostly because majority of missions revolve around silence and covert use of your abilities. This doesn't mean there won't be occasional action and killing as I shown before, as no matter what, sometimes a mission is bound to go badly. And while the shooting mechanic does the job when it's needed, it doesn't make the game stand out above games which focus on increasing your body count. Because the emphasis here is to only kill when you're forced to. By far the weakest part of the game is its story. It does start interesting when the titular character Sam Fisher is called upon to lead a newly formed top secret initiative called Third Echelon. Sam hasn't been on the field for some time but he's the right man for the job. Be better than good. Third Echelon is a brand new initiative. The role aggressive intelligence operations will play in NSA's future will depend largely on your performance. I'll see you on the far side of the course. We begin with training to prove we still got the touch. Here we get the grasp on what kind of line of work we're going to get ourselves into the near future. Acing the test course, we set out two months later for our first mission in Georgia to find two missing CIA agents. And of course, if you don't want spoilers, please go here. Assassinated on the orders of the Georgian president Nikolaze, we learn that the agents have found out that he was conducting secret ethnic cleansing campaign in Azerbaijan, which is still going strong. Thanks to their diligent effort, we pass this information and need to start searching for the obviously evil dictator. Sent to discover a critical data being exchanged on an oil rig while aerial bombardment is being deployed by our friends at NATO. Getting to the person of interest, it is revealed that the data in question is something called the Ark. Examining the data further, as always, the cliché antagonist has a mole in one of the critical federal governments and in this case, it's the CIA. The mole being our only lead to the whereabouts of the Georgian president. We penetrate silently the CIA headquarters, whose security is a bit lacking. Hacking the mainframe reveals that the leaked information comes from the personal computer of Mitchell Daughtry and we have the job to extract him which has to be one of my favorite moments in the game. Because the hack by Grimm's daughter was detected, good job to her, we receive a call by a technician named Ivan at Kalinatech. He fears for his life, as Nikolaz's goons are in the process of destroying all the evidence and killing all the witnesses. We find him hiding in the bathroom and almost being executed. We save him and demand the encryption key, which can help us find a trace of the evil dictator. Taking refuge in the Chinese embassy, we are tasked to listen to vital conversation between our primary target and General Fei Rong, who appear to have US military hostages and plan to 
execute them. Immediately dispatched to liberate them, we found Chinese dignitaries who revealed, surprise, surprise, Fei Rong doesn't represent China and is an active renegade. Back at the embassy, we managed to capture Fei Rong before he dies from the poison he drank earlier, making him give us access to his computer, showing that Nicolazzi is back at Georgia for the thing called the Ark. Infiltrating the presidential palace, our job is simple, get to the Ark before him and neutralize them both. Ambushed, Nicolazzi is saved by his goons, who appear to be a bit chatty, giving a little bit of time for Lambert to help us out. We manage to escape certain death and our final task is to assassinate Nicolazzi, the only person capable of activating the Ark and ultimately putting an end to this threat once and for all. Sharp work, Fisher. It's time to get scarce. That data you're carrying is the last of it. Splinter Cell doesn't have an award-winning story, but the setting, the characters and the whole rabbit chase is quite thrilling. It was exciting to experience this back in the day where covert and special ops were only present in filmmaking. The ability to blend in the shadows and roleplay as an elite operative, saving the world because an evil eastern dictator wishes only to conquer it, felt good. But even as a teenager, I was more invested into the characters and the wonderful gameplay. There are very few games out there like Splinter Cell. It is one of the diamonds in a very small pouch, where the best stealth games have remained for decades. A genre which although performs quite well, it's still considered as niche. The first Splinter Cell is by far not a perfect game, but compared to others that are trying to include stealth in their gameplay, it shines beautifully. It served as a stepping stone to two of the best sequels ever made, elevating its status as a franchise to be looked at as an example. It presented the player the ability to experience a different kind of world, it gave us Sam Fisher, a character whose abilities were unmatched in the field, a character that many of us stealth fans adore for what he represented. With his sarcastic personality, he quickly became one of my favorites. I simply wish he had a better send off. While fans await patiently for a new announcement, I stand and wonder if it's not best for the franchise to remain as it is. A lovely memory to be cherished and revisited, maybe even introduced to those who didn't have a chance before. And now be it the first Splinter Cell isn't the best stealth game ever ever made. It's a wonderful start to a remarkable franchise that some of us will never forget.